Now, June 20th is World Refugee Day. This day was established by the United Nations and numerous civil groups to honor the courageous and determined people that were forced to flee their countries because of a threat of persecution and violence. Joining us now to discuss the United Nations Human Rights Commission for Refugees report on the economic impact of refugees on host economies in Africa is UNHRC's regional spokesperson, Kitty McKinsey. Kitty, how big is the refugee problem uh, in Africa, how many refugees or displaced persons are we looking at? Well, we don't like to talk about it as a problem because refugees actually have a lot to offer. You know, it takes a lot of courage to flee your own country and uh, become a refugee. So we like to take, talk more about the courage and resilience of refugees and what they can actually do in the countries that they flee. And uh, Africa is the country, is a continent, you know, with a huge, huge number of refugees. And for example, one of the things that this latest report shows is that 81% of the refugees in the world are in countries with, uh, in developing countries with the lowest GDP. And this is up in the last 10 years from 70%. So countries in Africa are bearing really the brunt of the displacement in the world. And I think we have to be aware of that because sometimes when you look at headlines and you see the news, you know, you would think that it's uh, countries like Australia or Europe that are bearing the brunt. And really it's poor countries countries in Africa that are taking the burden. Before we jump into the, the economic implications um, and, and GDP, as you've already uh, noted, give us a, a, a clearer picture of what are the drivers behind displacement? Why are we seeing um, an increase in displacement and, and what's driving it? Well, the figures this if for two, at the end of 2012 show that war again is the biggest uh, driver. The numbers are the highest since 1994, when of course the the wars in uh, in former Yugoslavia and the genocide in Rwanda were the driver. Um, in uh, this year, of course, in Africa, uh, we see that people in to, in 2012 people were still fleeing Somalia, for example. Somalia is the second biggest producer of refugees refugees in the world. And uh, so, of course, some were fleeing drought. But since 1991 until last year, Somalia did not have a functioning government. So it's mainly war that causes people to flee. And it's important to note that not only do people flee and become refugees, which means they cross international borders, but even more are displaced within their own country. For example, the Democratic Republic of Congo, people overlooked that conflict. <coughs> but, you know, uh, the hundreds of thousands, more than a million people have been displaced from, from Democratic Republic of Congo into neighboring countries and even within their own country. So primarily it's war. Uh, there can be other causes. There can be um, a drought, um, ethnic persecution, things like that. And how are you uh, responding to, the, to um, displacement in its various forms? The UN Refugee Agency, obviously because of our name, we of course take care of refugees around the world. We're taking care of close to 11 million refugees. Then of course we have a sister agency that takes care of Palestinian refugees. Also, whenever uh, countries ask us to, we take care of people displaced within their own countries. These people are called uh, technically internally displaced people, but they're refugees in all but name. They simply have not crossed an international border. There's uh, close to 29 million of those, so this is a huge, huge number of people. It's more than 38 million, 38.5 million people around the world who come under our care. So uh, we do what, in course, in refugee situations, we respond immediately. Most people are familiar with the huge white tents, you know, with the hands uh, that are synonymous with the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, together with other partners, we offer food. In the, in the emergencies, we give everything that saves people's lives. What refugees normally are looking for in the first days is just to be safe. I mean, I've had so many refugees say to me, uh, you know, thank heavens nobody's shooting at me anymore. So immediately they want to be safe, we offer them protection. Then we offer them food, shelter, medical care. Later on, we may offer them schooling. And some people stay in exile for years, even though they only intended to stay for days or they thought they would only stay for days or weeks. So as time goes by, they may live in settlements, uh, in, uh, in something like approaching villages, and we, they have a more normal life like anybody else, uh, say, in Africa. 
given these increasing numbers then, Kitty, um, how many African states have signed the Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness to date? Uh, are you please forgive me, I was not prepared for that question, I don't actually know, but we're very encouraged that uh, more and more uh, African countries are moving towards that. There's been a, a big step forward and the African countries uh, met recently and they do recognize the need to reduce statelessness. Being stateless, I've met many stateless people, this is a very, very painful situation, but not all refugees are stateless. It's very, very important to make the distinction. Perhaps let's, uh, let's shift over to the pushback uh, that we often see by um, host, uh, host uh, countries that do take on stateless uh, refugees. Why are we seeing a, push, a pushback and how are you responding to this pushback? Okay, again, I think it's important to make a distinction. Refugees are not necessarily stateless, but um, many countries in Africa have been incredibly generous in taking on refugees because so many people in Africa have been refugees themselves. So I think in Af Africa is a continent where the, the state of being a refugee is better understood than many other places in the world. So I do think in, in Africa, that actually uh, states, governments are more understanding and more generous than in probably in some other parts of the world. It's natural for individuals, communities, governments to get tired of hosting people. We do understand that. And from the refugee's point of view, who wants to be a refugee for all of their life? It's not a nice way to live in somebody else's country not being in your own country. And most refugees that I've met fervently want to go home. Uh, so what we, uh, we want to help refugees go home because refugees themselves normally want to go home. But what we really insist on is that refugees should go home voluntarily when the time is right, when the conditions are safe, and when they themselves want to go home. So what we resist is any moves to force people to go back to their countries. And we're not seeing a lot of that in Africa. We see that there is a genuine understanding of the needs of refugees in Africa. Of course, Kitty, we cannot uh, divorce ourselves from the security concerns that oftentimes follow um, both internally displaced as well as stateless uh, refugees. How are you responding to, to these concerns? Well, this is a very, very broad question, and of course it comes a day after uh, you know, some of our colleagues lost their lives serving uh, refugees and returnees and people, uh, people in general in Somalia. Um, you know, uh, we express our condolences to our UN colleagues who were uh, killed and injured in uh, Somalia. But let's just take Somalia for an example. Uh, you know, we're very dedicated. I know my uh, colleagues with the UN Refugee Agency who are working in Somalia, they're incredibly dedicated to building a future for all the people in Somalia. And uh, it, we have a sense that things, the tide has finally turned, that Somalia has, the, has a government finally, that things are getting better. And so we're dedicated to remaining with the people of Somalia. Um, we want security not, f not f only for ourselves, but more, more importantly for the people in the country. We want security in every country so that refugees can go home. And in the case of Somalia, we want to help support the government there and to build institutions and move from humanitarian aid to development so that there will be a functioning society, um, justice, law and order administration so that people can go home and stay home so they will not have to go home and become displaced within their own country or leave again and become refugees again. Um, Kitty, how are you then able to leverage the, the partnerships that you obviously need uh, from international partners as well as national governments to, to bridge the gap between the increasing number of ref refugees internally and, and externally with the resources that you have at hand? This is very much a challenge. The UN Refugee Agency is a little bit unusual because we get almost very, very small, small amount of our funds, about 3%, 6% from the General Assembly, and we actually have to raise the rest of our money from uh, governments, uh, a small amount from corporations, very small amount from individuals. In some countries we do face-to-face -face fundraising and we actually go out on the street and ask people to donate money to us. So this is a real challenge, and especially in the, the world that we live in now with uh, all the economic hardship that you see in countries around the world, 
uh, it's very difficult to ask governments and to ask individuals to give money for refugees, but um, we're very uh, fortunate that people still are being very generous. And in Western countries, when people, I think when people understand truly how little refugees need, they just want safety, basically. They just want protection. They don't want people shooting at them. And I think when uh, people in the donor countries, especially in the West, realized how blessed they are just to be able to have three meals a day, sleep at night, not have anybody shooting at them, not have to flee, not have to decide what one possession it is they want to take, not have to even decide which of their children they're going to take when they flee. I think when people realize that, it makes it easier for them to give. And we're always conscious that we have to use the money very, very wisely to benefit the people we serve, all the displaced people, the refugees, and the people displaced within Thank their own country.